How you feeling, family? Feeling good? I said, how you feeling, family? Feeling good? There we go, man. It's so good to be here. I'd like to welcome all of our locations, Oviedo, South Orlando, Sanford. Give them a minute. Welcome back. Winter Park's in the building. It's so good to be at Winter Park this morning. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, my name is Kenneth. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at Action Church. have the privilege of leading uh, our Sanford location and also have the privilege of sitting on our operational leadership team. And really what, what I love about our church is the, 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 the very fabric of who we are, that we're going to reach people right where they are and connect them to everything that God has for their life, which is so important. And I love the outreaches that we get to be a part of in all of our different communities. God is doing something through action and through you, through your faithfulness. So if you call this place home as a pastor, I just want to just thank you for what we get to be a part of in this community. If you love action, give this place a hand clap. Come on. And those of you that don't clap, it's, it's cool. We'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, it's okay. It's okay. Man, I'm excited uh, about this message. This was something that actually had an opportunity to share with our Sanford uh, location a couple months ago. And so it's been in me and, and really just want to take us on a journey. But before we get into the, the word this morning, I just want to encourage you that God is already working on your solution. God is already working on a problem that you didn't even know you had. Anybody got a problem you're walk, walking through? Oh, Two. Amen. Cool, okay. Uh, cool, okay, a couple people here anyway. The truth is, sometimes before you even know there's a problem, God already has a solution en route. Everybody say, en route. En route. Say it with your chest. Say, en route. en route. There's a solution en route. Man, a few, few, few weeks ago, we were... We've been in this renovation project at our Sanford location. It looks amazing. And so there was a day that we needed to, to, to get, we needed to rent a box truck. So our team had rented the box truck and it was supposed to be delivered. Anybody waiting on something and never got delivered from a company, especially during COVID right now? They're like, oh, we didn't, we just not coming today. So that was, we were like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you told us. But we found out that we had a problem. And what was crazy, we ended up calling one of our pastors here. Pastor John Williams does a lot of different things. He said, PK, you know what? I got a box truck coming to you. I'm, I'm driving one right now. And I thought, my God, won't he do it? The truth is, the chances of that really happening, that he just happened to have a box truck, happened to be on 417, happened to be coming to me. But the problem is, or the, the, the cool thing is, I didn't even know I had a problem when I woke up that morning. And I didn't even know I had a problem, but God had already had a solution coming down 417. Amen. There are some things that you may be walking through right now, or maybe you didn't even know you had. And I just need to let you know that God's got a solution for you. Be encouraged that your solution to your challenge or your problem is in route. Now, check this out. That wasn't the box truck that I ordered, Pastor Eddie. It wasn't what I, I had a three-seater. They gave me a two-seater. I wanted a 24-foot. They gave me a 16. You got to work with what you got. I'm saying sometimes when you pray and you ask and you believe in something, it may not always come in the form that you wanted or you requested, but you're going to make do with it. What you need is available to you. The Bible talks about the oil is in the house. What you need is available to you. You have everything you need to get to where God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. Look to your neighbor and say, everything you need. Everything. All right, work with me. Okay, cool. So we're going we're gonna to jump right into it today. The title of today's message is Framing Faith Over Fear. Framing Faith Over Fear. You and I can live a life of faith or we can live a life of fear. It's up to us. It's up to you and I. You, we, you and I get to decide. So the, the question is, who deals with this, Pastor Kenneth? Who deals with going from faith to fear? Fear from faith. We all do. Me and you. Your mama and your cousin too. 11 o'clock looking at me like I'm crazy. Y'all know that song. But there's a few of you that are singing it. We're going to have a prayer team down here at the end of service. Singing them 90 club songs. I see you. It's all good. We're going to have a little fun in church. It's all good. But we all, we all deal with this family. There are some fears that 
you and I have completely, that are completely irrational, that they don't serve us well or have a purpose. Research, we, research has shown that there's two fears that we're born with. And that's the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. If you don't believe me, grab a baby and let it go. See what happens. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not literally. I would never do that. Maybe. So, but no, you were born with those two fears. That's the only, but what's crazy, that means everything else that you and I are navigating through was learned. Which also means it can be unlearned through the word of God, through our time in his presence. You don't have to stay stuck in some of those fears that are preventing you and I from experiencing what God has for us. Through my study, I discovered that some of our top fears, and if you're like me, maybe a couple of these you, you resonate with. So these are some of the top fears that you and I deal with. Fear of change. Anybody have a fear of change? Man, you don't, don't, don't move my stuff. Fear of loneliness. The crazy thing about loneliness, you can have a house full of people and be lonely. You can have a party going, mm -hmm, or no, whatever. You can have something going on and still be lonely. Maybe it's the fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of uncertainty. Maybe the fear of something bad happening, the fear of getting hurt. Fear of being judged. Fear of being inadequate. So let me ask you, family, what, what do all these fears have in common? They will absolutely hold you and I back from experiencing a God-filled life. When we operate in these fears, there's a blockage that takes place that you and I will never experience what God has laid out for us. What's crazy is fear can have a voice, but not a vote. And what I mean by that, we, we're going to navigate through fear and faith. But fear just cannot be part of the equation of your decision. You may have a voice, but it doesn't get a vote in your life. So what is fear? The dictionary defines fear as this. An unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. Have you ever just been like stuck in your fear of something that's coming? It has like gripped you in a way that you can't even process. Some of us have lost nights of sleep anticipating fear. Some of us lost our mornings anticipating fear. It was crazy. I was listening to this podcast with Michael Jordan, who is the GOAT, and if you don't believe it, we'll pray for you here at the end of service today. <laughs> but what he was saying, he said when he played, he saw players that would just be so focused on failing or shooting shots that they would fail. Like just being locked in that mode. And he just said, I never thought like that. Why would I fear over a shot that I've never taken? And that mindset hit me in such a way, it's so true. You and I will sometimes, we'll miss out on opportunities because we're so focused on how it could go poorly and how we could fail that we're full of fear, not full of faith. And we'll miss out. We won't even try some things. You don't even know how it's gonna, how it's gonna go because you've never done it. But yet we will lose so much time focusing on fear, and we miss out on what God wants to do. I can tell you this, family, it's never going to feel comfortable to do something you've never done before. There is going to be a point where you got to jump, take a step, make a move. I put a beat to that. That's a rap right there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the crazy thing is the Bible talks about a couple types of fears. It says in Proverbs Chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of his wisdom. Amen. And knowledge of the, of the Holy One is, is understanding. 
2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Fear comes in fast, family, and none of us are immune to it. Have you ever been in a situation where you were, one moment you were calm, and you got a phone call, you got a text message, you got an email, and you went from, from cool, full of faith, to full of fear? Anybody? Four. Okay, we're better. We're better. We're better than we were five minutes ago. But it comes in fast. Man, this summer we were vacationing with, with another family here, and, and we were, went to a place called Kelly Rock Springs. Anybody ever been there? My wife is white, so this was her day that she planned a vacation. So this isn't what I do. I said, that was not my day. We had seven days, and that was, one, that was hers. Floating in a river with things that I don't get or understand. It's not my day. So anyway, we were there. Y'all laughing with me, not at me. I get it. So we're there, and there's a lot of our friends and family that's there, and so a lot of us, and, and we, went, we were having a good time. They were having a great time, and so... And then in a moment, we could not locate our middle daughter. And we have hundreds of people around. And you talk about going from, from one position to full of fear like this. Because then it's, and what, what's crazy about our fears, isn't it amazing how we will rush to the worst case scenario like that? One moment, we're here, and the next moment, did she drown? Who took her? Oh my God. I, I mean, uh, the swing was so fast and so quick. But that happens so much in our life. And what's crazy is when we, when we found her, she was floating on the river. And she's like, hey, you know, we, we got her. And you know that moment where you're about to snatch up your child? Well, maybe y'all don't snatch him up over here at Winter Park in Stanford. We snatch him up. Like, so we was, but she didn't do anything wrong. She was right where she needed to be. She actually, I, the story is, she told her big sister and her big sister didn't tell. I don't know what it, I still ain't got that at the bottom of it. All I, I was going to snatch her up too. But so, <laughs> the point is, you go from full of faith to full of fear so quickly. Why don't we do that? And what's crazy is she never knew she was missing. I think sometimes you and I are in these places full of fear and God is not even threatened by it. He's not even moved by it. It's because of our experiences. It's because of some of those things we talked about. We've created some of these fears and God's like, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not, I didn't go nowhere. I'm right here. I didn't know we were fearful over that. Why, why? So we, we have to go through seasons where we navigate through that. Sometimes we can be so overwhelmed with fear and the solution is right there with us. Like the presence of God is right there with us. For me, sometimes it seems that we're constantly moving from one season of uncertainty to another season of uncertainty. You ever notice that? How, man, God, get us out of this. God, I'm believing for this. And that breakthrough happens on a Monday. And then Wednesday, guess what? We're right back here with the new uncertainty. What I can promise you, family, is we're going to live life of uncertainty. Because you cannot control. But how we can control is how we posture our heart towards God, how we posture our mindset and believing in the things in the Bible of actually what God spoke, his living word, and when we posture it from that place, man, it changes everything. It changes everything in our life. It's amazing. The story, uh, there's an overnight experience that happens where the disciples and Jesus just, they just came off like this dope mirror. Like it was fine. They, they fed 5,000 people with, with a couple fish and some, and, some, and some nuggets, you know? A biscuit and a nugget. A fish sandwich. And it was crazy. They, was, they were just, they was geeked about this. They could not believe what, what Jesus did. And they was full of fear at the beginning of that miracle. Oh, what, we got all these people. What are we going to do? What you going to do, G? What you going to do, God? What's up? And, and Jesus pulls this off. 
just hours later, they're right back. They went from uncertainty. Jesus came through. Hours later, right back to uncertainty. We're going to pick it up in the scriptures right here. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. I love, I love that. Jesus insisted. You ever know, anytime you have to insist, that means somebody didn't, didn't want you to do it. I can just imagine. He's like, get in the boat. <laughs> hey, ah, I'm going to snatch you. Get in that boat. I can just see, y'all, y'all don't see it though? That's, the Bible say insisted. I didn't say it. Okay. After sending him home, he went up and to the hills by himself to pray. Night, night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. For a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost, it's Casper. But Jesus, no, it's not, it's not Casper. Don't, don't, don't quote me on that. So, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. Then Peter called to him. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. So what can we learn from Peter? I'm going to give us a few pointers that that I think we can learn together from Peter. We're still talking about this because of his focused faith and his vulnerability. That's why we're still talking about a story that took place so long ago. So, number one, I'd love for you to write this down. It says, focus on Jesus and keep focusing on Jesus. That's the first thing that we can learn from from Peter. Distractions, family, will cause you and I to lose focus. There will be storms. And Jesus is aware of the storm. Somebody needs to hear this. Sometimes we get in storms and we feel like God has left us. Sometimes we get in situations and maybe it's your health or your your family or your job or whatever's happening in your life where you feel like I am alone and he has left me. I'm telling you right now, Jesus has never changed his position. And if anything's ever changed, it's, it's, it's what we have focused on. And when we shift our focus, it's very difficult to say, where is Jesus? I don't see him. He's like, hey, cuz, I'm right here. That's how Jesus talked to me. (laughs) Hey, cuz, I'm right here. But I don't see you. He's like, turn around. Oh, cool. What, What was the difference? I shifted my focus. And we take our focus off Jesus. Things are just more difficult. There will be storms, but God is with you, family. We get into trouble when we focus more on the temporary circumstances that's happening around us than what God is trying to do on the inside of us. We get so consumed with these, with, with the world around us that we can't stop to think what God wants to work out in us, what he wants to do inside of us. Peter was good when, when he was focused, but Peter got into trouble when he lost sight of his next step. So what does focusing on Jesus look like for you? Because it's different for all of us. We're all in different seasons and situations in our life. But what, what could it look? Maybe it's running your business with integrity. Maybe that's a, a way you can focus on Jesus. Maybe it's getting out of that relationship that you know you should not be in. That is destroying you. That it's toxic. And it's not life-giving. Maybe spending more time with your family. I know there's been seasons of my life where my job and my career got the best of me and my family got the rest of me. 
Maybe it's getting the help that you need to better your life so you can shift your focus. And sometimes, man, that may be getting counseling or being part of a small group or getting connected around some people. You're, we were built and made for each other. Yes. You cannot do this journey successfully by yourself. We need each other. Look at your neighbor and say, I need you. And look at the one that you disrespected and say, I need you. <laughs> I said disrespected because you didn't look at them first. <laughs> you always go to your favorite first. And if it wasn't your spouse, that's on you. We got married small groups. <laughs> Sometimes, maybe it's just going deeper in your relationship with God. And that could look like, man, and your worship. I know, man, we do a fantastic, amazing job at our worship. All of our locations leading us in worship every Sunday. But worship isn't just singing to God. We can worship with our time. Being a part of outreaches. We, should, we can worship spending time in his, his word. We can worship God with our giving. So many different ways that you can worship God. I was thinking about this. The word of God will never make sense if we view it through broken lenses. Like, when you read the word of God and you're like, hmm, that's not for me. You read the word of God and you say, eh, I don't get it. That was for them. That was for Pastor Eddie. Because, you know, Pastor Eddie always looked good in his suits. You think, oh, Pastor Eddie got it all worked out. The, the scriptures are for him. They're for somebody else. They're not for me. Anytime we read the word of God through broken lenses, we'll never get everything that the word of God is for us. Which is why we need to heal from our past trauma so we can truly experience the word of God. There's been seasons where I read the word and it was through my brokenness, through some of the fears that I read off in the beginning and I see the word through that lens. I see the word through uncertainty. I see the word through I'm not good enough and I look at the scriptures and I say, God, may... Why not me? And I got very Eeyore-ish. You know, Eeyore from the cartoon. Who guess the word of God is not for me? Oh, woe is me. I'm so happy for brother over there. He got the word of God. And it's not for me. It's because my lenses are broken. But when we go through healing and restoration, and then you look at the word of God, and you're like, oh, it's like it, I can look at what the word of God said to me it changes everything when you look at the word of God you say I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and nobody can tell me any different that God has a plan and God has a purpose and what he started in me he is not even clearly done but when I look at it through brokenness that's not for me maybe one day he'll do it. I'm telling you today is your So, second thing, write this down. Obey Jesus. Obey Jesus. Jesus told Peter to come to him. It made no sense, but Peter obeyed. Peter took one step to get out of the boat. Family, sometimes that's all we got to do is take one step. Look at your neighbor and say, one step. Sometimes all you got to do is one step. What we're trying to do is put all the pieces together, and it's overwhelming. And God has never called us to put all the pieces together. God said, trust me. Take one step. I'm not a big puzzle guy, but I know when that puzzle lays out at my house, I'm like, oh my God, a thousand piece puzzle, not for me. <laughs> but it looks, it looks overwhelming. And I see, like I'm not a part of that. As my family's putting that together, <laughs> day 45, <laughs> they got like four pieces left. I'm like, nah, there you go, good job. You know, it looks... Like they finished it. But if you try to figure out the end, you will never take a step. If you try to put all the pieces together, you'll never take a step. And what God is calling us to do is take a step. And then you'll take another step. And before you know it, your puzzle's complete. But if you never take a step because it's so overwhelming, we will miss out on what God wants to complete in us. So what could that next single step be? Man, all of our locations. 
do outreaches every week. Get connected. Why do we talk about outreach so much? This is what it does. It shifts your focus. Because when you go out and serve somebody else, you realize, you know what? Maybe my Tuesday wasn't that bad. Because the truth is exactly what you're experiencing and what you have was a season ago that you prayed for it. And somebody's playing, praying right now for what you consider a problem. But you don't get that when we're focused on our own stuff. But what outreach does, it takes you out of your world and it puts you in somebody else's world, which is what we call empathy. And there's no more powerful two words than me too. That when you, when you say, Pastor Eddie, this is what I'm going through, and he says, me too. I got you. That's why we do life together. Maybe your next step is being part of an outreach. Maybe your next step is joining that small group. We do small groups because God has called us to be together as a family. We don't do small groups so we can talk about numbers. We do small groups so we can stay connected because on a Tuesday night at 1 a.m. and you need somebody, we're going to rally around you. and You will never on our watch go through that thing by yourself. Because neither one of us will ever feel fulfill what God has called us to do by ourselves. We need each other. Speaking of small groups, I'm going to read this story. Every, uh, for the last year and a half at our Sanford location, there's a team that goes out that feeds the unsheltered every Tuesday and every Friday. And this is a letter that came from a young man. That is, this letter came from prison. And he wrote this just a few weeks ago. And this is what it says. It says, what's up, fellas? I hope this thank you letter finds... Y'all well and blessed. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come out to all those camps and minister to us. Every time I would see that red truck pull up, I knew love, smiles, good food was there. Thank y'all. We only had a brief time together, as you know, I'm sure. I was battling in many areas of my life at that time. I was homeless, unemployed, addicted, dealing with unforgiveness. Nevertheless, each of you guys loved me and always greeted me as a child of God. I will always be grateful to God for sending believers full of faith and hope and love. <laughs> Pastor Kenneth even blessed me with a sweet huffy bike. I'm going to ask the team to put the picture up here. This is, his name is Abijah. And he says, I remember he said every time I looked down at the bike to remember somebody loved me. And right now I can't stop the tears. I can't stop the tears um, from my eyes from the expression of love. That expression of love and words will stick with me forever. You brothers and sisters at Action Church have reached so many men and women from Tuesday and Friday outreaches. I know the hearts of many of those you've reached from the kind smiles, gentle prayers, good food, and y'all have truly been the hands and feet of Jesus. As you can see, I'm writing from jail. This is God's grace and mercy. He saved me from hell's doorstep. Hallelujah, praise God. And after weeks of detox and physical rehabilitation, he blessed me with the word. And so we began a daily proverb and Bible study. That's a small group in prison. Come on, somebody from, from Hot Mills. I met, uh, and then many, many men here I met know of God and have witnessed him in their life, but yet to know his word and the power of prayer, which is fellowship. So Action Church, I want to express personally the love, all the seeds y'all planted in those parking lots, storefronts, woods, downtown, and sidewalks that has taken roots in his grace and mercy in my life and many more. I look forward to coming back home to Action Church when released around Thanksgiving. Thank you. Love you all. I love, I love, love, love. I love what we get to do as a church and that is reach people and show people the love of God. All of us sitting in this room is because someone showed that expression to us and that's what God has called you and I to do. And a lot of times, your next step is not about you and not about your comfort. Your next step is typically about serving somebody else. Amen. Number three, Faith unleashes the supernatural. 
Come on, somebody. Faith unleashes the supernatural. Peter did not experience the supernatural power of God until he focused and trusted on Jesus. Once he set his focus, that's when he experienced the supernatural. So why didn't the other disciples walk on water? Because they were focused on the storm. They were focused on the wind. They were not focused on Jesus. So you and I will not experience the supernatural focused on natural things. You and I will focus or you and I will experience the love and the supernatural power of God when we focus on the power and the supernatural power. We're going to focus. So what could you and I be doing differently to experience the love of God, to experience the supernatural? Number four, write this down. Fear will sink you. Fear will sink you. I got this highlighted in my notes. Faith you walk, fear you sink. Faith he got on the water and took a step. And fear, the other disciples stayed in. What fear is controlling your decision making? I highlighted this as well. Never make permanent decisions over temporary circumstances. So many of us live in the moment of something and then we make decisions based in that moment. Sometimes those decisions don't serve us well. You ever make a decision one day and four days later, you're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Number five, write this down. Little faith is better than no faith. Little faith is better than no faith, family. Jesus spoke of Peter's little faith. This means he was capable of even greater faith. There are some things in you that are seeds in you that you are called to greatness. And all you have is just a little bit of faith. And that's all that God needs. It's just a little bit of faith. And you will do some things, go to places in your life that you never imagined just by having a little bit of faith. Number six as I close. You can choose to worry or worship. You can, it's your choice how we experience it. You can worry and stress. And being 43 years old, it's never changed anything. Me worrying harder didn't make God come faster. <laughs> the truth is, in a moment, the disciples went from worrying about the storm and their circumstances to worshiping the Almighty God. In a moment. That's a word for somebody too. You may be in the toughest season of your life, but in a moment you can decide to choose to worship God. And it'll change. I highlighted this. Faith doesn't eliminate the distraction. It shifts the attention. And what's crazy is that our fear is powered by our focus. But so is our faith. What we focus on is going to give it power. And when we focus on Jesus, our faith increases. And we focus on fear, then we live in doubt. So let me illustrate, illustrate this for us as I close I've been, I've been uh, working on this whole week. Thought I did pretty good. But what, what if our worship was this frame? And what I want you guys to see here, all of us, is this is really a picture of our life. There's a little bit of everything in there. Man, there's some tough seasons. The sun is there, the water's there. Man, we fishing. Somebody's got a boat. Whoever boat that is, let me know. I'd love to come out. <laughs> this is us. But this is what happens. Get this. Whatever we focus on, whatever we frame, is what the outcome will be. So when we go to frame right here, that's what we get. And it's dark. It's heavy. Does God see me? 
no son anywhere. How did we get here? Maybe that's your marriage. Maybe that's your health. Maybe that's your kids. I'm not sure. But it's dark. And as long as your frame is there, then that's going to be the outcome. This is some of us here. And we got a little bit of the sun. And we got a paddle board. Again, that's, that's not your boy. It's not Pastor Kim right there on the paddle board. But this is where most of us are. We're pretty comfortable. Status quo. I don't need much. But I'm not living a God-filled life. I'm not living his promises. And anytime we need to refocus, sometimes you have to pull back from your situation and focus. And what I love about this picture is the storm's still happening. The conditions hadn't changed, but my focus has. And when I focus on Jesus, I haven't seen see that rainbow that's in there. Focusing on his promises that he promised us. That he'll never leave you. And he'll never forsake you. And there's nothing you could ever go through that he's not present for. Just because you don't feel him does not mean he is not there. Just because you can't see him does not mean he's not there. He is ever present in every situation you and I will ever go to reframe your focus to experience all that God has for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to do the most important thing that we do every work, every week at Action Church. Just present the gospel. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, Pastor Kenneth, none of this makes sense. I don't have a relationship with God. Or I had one and I, I, I don't have one any longer. I've walked away. I just need you to know that, that Jesus came and lived that perfect life. And then died a sinner's death. And then rose out of that tomb. And the Bible says, man, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, then Jesus is our Lord. We'll spend eternity with him. I just want to make that opportunity for all of us to encounter Jesus like never before. That she feel like I'm, I'm tired of trying to do this by myself. I'm trying to start, tired of trying to live this life by myself. I want God to come in my life and make me different. I want to pray for us in the moment. If that's you, any of our locations online, just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for us. Just slip your hand up high. I see you right here. Thank you so much. I see you in the balcony. Come on, Sanford. Come on, Oviedo. Come on, South Orlando. Right there at home in your living room, the counter. I want to make Jesus Lord. Just slip your hand. What a moment. Everybody can put their hands down. I'm going to say this prayer out loud as you say it in your heart. Say something like this. Say, God, I, I hear you speaking to me. I know you're real. I need you to come into my life and make me different. God, I know I've been doing a lot of things, but God, I need you in my life. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you're my Savior and you're my Lord. I leave this auditorium, my living room, I leave it different because I encountered you today. Come into my life and make me different. God, I love you. I thank you for your grace and your love. And God, I pray for all of us. That God, as we leave our, leave our auditoriums, that we would frame you in the middle. Not our circumstances, not our problems, not our challenges, but we would focus on you. We will live a God-filled life that you have called us to live. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Action Church said, amen. Can we celebrate those decisions, family?